So, I mean, it seems like you have uh, looked at two rather different kinds of subjects. I mean, you look at very huge subjects like nuclear weapons and the climate, but then you also have these very, very small subjects uh, that you are focusing on. Uh, I mean, you have drawn our attention to the traffic signals, you know, red and green, the, the sign of equals in mathematics and accounting and so on. So uh, it seems that you have a mixture of uh, big topics and small topics. Uh, I'm actually mainly, we sort of like know, we have your analysis, we are very eager to learn from you. So uh, how would you sort of like both formulate the kind of topics that you pick and how would you give advice, practical tips to how people pick the good topics? Uh, I mean, a sh very sharp sense of observation surely is uh, uh, part of it, but... Uh. I think you would be surprised at how many big topics I worked on I didn't pick, they picked me. Oh, okay. I'll give you an example. Uh, 35 years ago, 34 years ago, I was sitting minding my own business in my Harvard office and I got a phone call from somebody at the National Academy of Sciences who said he wanted to come to Cambridge, buy me a drink and talk me into chairing a committee. I said, a committee on what? And he said, on global warming and climate change. I said, I don't know the slightest thing about global warming and climate change. He said, everything that is known you can learn in six weeks. <laughs> and the committee can't meet for six weeks anyhow. Can I come up and buy you a drink? I said, okay, come on up and see if you can talk me into it. So he came up and talked me into it. And what happened was that uh, President Carter was going to what they called a summit meeting in Venice, a meeting of eight heads of government. And Helmut Schmidt, the Chancellor of Germany, who was an enthusiast for nuclear electric power, was having a hard time getting his constituents in Germany opposed to coal in order to favor nuclear power. So he put on the agenda of the summit meeting the uh, carbon dioxide problem. I think in order to publicize that fossil fuels were, were not nice. And uh, I had an excellent committee, uh, partly because they, they, it was to be a committee of 12. They'd already chosen eight of the 12 and I said, you must let me choose the remaining four, and I chose oh, people like George Bundy who uh, had been uh, President Kennedy's national security advisor, people like that. And we wrote a persuasive brief report to the White House saying the best thing to do about that item on the agenda is to get it off the agenda. That the United States is not prepared to take a position on the subject. Well, I thought that was the end of my responsibility for climate change, but then the Congress appropriated a large amount of money for a big study by the National Academy of Sciences of the carbon dioxide problem. So I, was, I wasn't chairman, but I was on that committee and we must have met 50 days of meetings in the course of which I became probably the best educated amateur on the subject of climate change. Everybody else on the committee was an expert in something, atmospheric chemistry, atmospheric physics, oceanography, agronomy, uh, all kinds of things related to climate change. Uh, it was interesting. At that time, there were almost no climate scientists. There were all kinds of scientists who had something to do with climate. There were meteorologists who did weather predictions. 
that were, well, today's president of the National Academy of Sciences, Ralph Cicerone, was one of the atmospheric chemists who first discovered the, what was called the ozone hole in Antarctica. People like that, they were all pertinent to climate, but none of them, with one exception, a guy named Roger Ravel, none of them considered himself or herself a climate scientist. They all had something to do with climate, but the climate wasn't really a, uh, a science in those days. It's altogether different now. You know, there are thousands of people who consider themselves climate scientists, but then th 35 years ago, there really weren't. And uh, I wrote the chapter in that big study called Policy and Welfare Implications of Climate Change and decided, okay, now I'm done with it. But then it turned out that every time somebody wanted an economist to do something about climate change, they would go to a Rolodex and look up economics and find my name. <laughs> so I'm still in the business. And, uh, but I didn't pick the subject, it picked me. Well, I, I read your answers to the first question on theorizing. You're talking, when I asked you those questions, you mention a lot the kind of observations you make, very sharp observations. When I asked you about the subject, you mentioned that the subjects choose you. It's my experience, actually, of academics that they are extremely slow to pick up on new topics, and particularly topics that are happening in the world around them. They're on these five-year projects, whatever. If the world blows up on the other side, they don't really care. So actually, I think that what you're saying is that this extreme flexibility to the topic, you can learn it in six weeks, all you need, etc. That's a great key. Let me ask you, I mean, you have been a teacher for a long time, so presumably you want your students to not only get the, well, the content of the books and so on. So do you have specific exercises for your students? I mean, how do you teach students? What do you give to them? apart from mere content. Are there specific practical exercises that you give them? Uh, when you were teaching at the Kennedy School and so on, and these courses on conflict, and how did you try to make the students come alive? Mainly, I usually call the, the, the class uh, conflict and cooperation or something like that. Mainly I tried to find intriguing puzzles and get the class to try to solve the puzzle. Help them with it if they needed help. Then I actually I invented a, a new style of teaching. Uh, when I was teaching Harvard undergraduates, I wanted a class small enough that they could act like a committee to solve a problem. So I insisted that I have only 15 students. With me, it would be a total of 16, four on each side of a square table that held 16 people. And I would pose a puzzle and try to get them to solve it. And it, that worked very well until I decided I really should uh, teach more than 16 people. So I had two classes. One met Monday and Wednesday, the other met Tuesday and Thursday. And then I th thought, you know, 32 students, I'd still rather have more than 32 students, but the class, our arrangements were such but I finally decided the only way I can have three classes of 16 students <coughs> is to meet each class once a week, and it must meet once a week without me. So I had a puzzle for every week, and I had a chairman assigned <coughs> for each meeting of the class and a rapporteur who would take notes and bring me the notes so that when I met the class, 
I would know whether they had solved the problem or not, and if they hadn't solved it, I'd help them solve it, and if they had solved it, we could go on and discuss the implications. And it was remarkable how that worked. They could actually conduct the class all by themselves. And in a way, it was, I think, more challenging to them. I, I think they took huge, huge pride when they succeeded in solving the problem without me there. <laughs> and uh, so I did that for, for several years. And some of those students eventually became faculty colleagues of mine who remembered the uh, the technique by which they had to spend an hour <coughs> seeing if they could solve a puzzle. Can you give us a puzzle? I mean, uh, just the uh, idea of a puzzle? I mean, yeah. Uh, three people, A, B, and C, Anderson, Barnes, and Kramer. Each has a gun with unlimited ammunition. A referee will choose one to begin shooting. And when you shoot the gun, you can either shoot in the air or shoot one of the people. And before beginning to shoot, each person gets to make one statement a statement that can be a conditional statement indicating how he will shoot. And each makes a statement in turn. The referee will pick who makes the first statement, and then in clockwise order, who makes the second statement, who makes the third statement. And the question is, what statement does the first person make? What, if any, statements the other two will make? And with what probabilities do any of them survive? I, th I think the rule also was, at some stage, if all three are alive, the referee will pick one at random and force him to shoot somebody. And so the class was to figure out if you're the first person to make a statement, what kind of statement do you make, knowing that whatever you say you will do, including what you will do probabilistically, such as I will shoot somebody with a two-thirds chance of missing, the referee will enforce it. Well, I just got this out of a puzzle book. I ended up with about 12 or 15 books of puzzles. Some of the puzzles were somewhat mathematical. Most of them were logical puzzles of some kind. And uh, once in a while, somebody in the class would get this one right. But it was a hard one. And uh, I knew it was hard because it had taken me four hours on a Sunday afternoon to solve the puzzle myself. So I didn't really expect them to solve it. But occasionally, one of them caught on. And it was a... It was a way of formulating a commitment that would lead one of the other two to shoot the other of the two in order to have a probability of survival because the first person's statement was that whoever shot the other one would have a 5% chance of surviving, namely, I will shoot at you with a 95% chance of killing you and a 5% chance of missing. Well, that was about as tough a problem as I could give them. But uh, like that one, many of them were taken straight out of puzzle books, all of which had a logical solution that almost always had some relation to bargaining. 
Let me ask a last question before the audience can come in. Uh, you once cooperated with a sociologist, Irving Goffman, in 1966. He supposedly was at Harvard and you two uh, uh, worked together. Uh, could you say something about uh, uh, that meeting with Goffman, but also more generally? I mean, what, what are the qualities in a sociologist? What qualities should a sociologist have? I mean, did Irving Goffman have these qualities in your mind? Or was it more that you uh, met him on this? I mean, he was talking about management of self and so on, and you have been interested in self-management. Or what exactly was it in your encounter? And can you generalize a little bit to sociologists? Yeah, I think Irving Goffman was the the epitome of a game theoretical sociologist. He was, see, game theory really concerns the interactions among individuals when each is either trying to forecast, conjecture what the other will do knowing that the other is reciprocally trying to guess what I will do according to what I expect him to do, or else to influence each other to make threats and promises so structured as to get the other person to do something or to avoid something you want him to avoid. And I don't think Irving Goffman ever studied game theory but he was just about the best game theorist I ever met in terms of his ability to, to do that kind of thinking. He didn't formalize it in terms of a payoff matrix indicating wh which of all the outcomes you rank in what kind of an order. But uh, he was good at thinking about when, if you overhear something, should you pretend you didn't hear it? Especially if you'd be obliged to respond if it's known that you heard it. And I think he used the word ratification. When, when do you, so to speak, ratify that you, you heard something? And I remember he was, he was good at thinking, if you want to spoil somebody's composure, make them feel awkward, give them clothing without pockets. Because if you can put your hands in your pockets, that's a casual act. It's an act of a person who's comfortable, who's relaxed. But if you're standing there with your hands hanging out and nothing to do with them, uh, it, it makes them lose confidence and feel awkward. And he mentioned that, I think the first thing of his I read was the presentation of self in everyday life or something like that. He, he referred to total institutions. A total institution was an institution that, that attempted to govern every aspect of your life. He said, military institutions, prisons, nunneries, girls' schools, and many of them feel that they must break down your personality so that you can't resist. You can't even think of resisting. And a lot of that has to do with the kinds of uniforms you design making people sometimes wear skirts instead of pants. I will always remember one of the cleverest things that Irving Goffman ever said. He said, a woman can be undressed in front of her sister. A woman can be undressed in front of her husband. But a woman cannot be undressed in front of her sister and her husband. <laughs> and that would never have occurred to me, but the moment he said it, I realized he was the 
damn best observer of people I ever knew. I have about eight of his books, one of which I had at that time, I had some funds from the Ford Foundation to bring scholars to Harvard to work. I was in the Center for International Affairs and I could bring people in and, and I, I brought a number of outstanding people, but one was Irving Goffman and he completed one of his books with me and I, I remember he, he had, has a book called Stigma in which he described such things as when if you believe you have some kind of stigma that is visible you want to do your business by telephone so they can't see what's your problem it might be that you are African American or Oriental American or or it might be that you are physically deformed in some fashion. It may be simply that you are nervous in the presence of people whom you consider your superior or people who don't share whatever your stigma is, in which case you can be more nearly anonymous over the telephone or if you're afraid that your voice will give you away, then you can write. And I suppose now with all of the things that people carry around with them everywhere in the world, they can do it all by writing if they wish to. And then I think they don't even have to worry about misspelling because if you misspell, they can think that you're, you're inventing a, a new uh, acronym of some kind. Anyway, if, if, if you don't know Irving Goffman, pick up any one of his books and uh, you'll be intrigued and you'll want to read most of the rest of them.